What is wrong with these protesters? It's almost like everything done to protect our country, whether it's in, in ongoing geopolitical battles to keep the lights on, bring down energy bills so we can just go about heating our homes and Mrs Miggins doesn't die this winter. They don't want that to happen. People coming into the country illegally on boats, they don't want that to happen. They want them to just, I don't know, live wherever they want to do, regardless of who they are. I often think, you know, if you've got the Scottish part, the SNP today calling for us to take um, refugees from Palestine, and I'm there thinking, well, hold on. If you're just saying to people from Palestine, come one, come all to Scotland, how do you know you're getting Hamas or the people being used as human shields by Hamas? It is a madness. Um, but the Bibby Stockholm reopened once again. Um, but it seems to me that not many people are going to end up on it. No, I mean, I think Just Stop Anything was actually being a bit empty today because there wasn't that many on the coach. I think at any stage, it's 520 will be the maximum that will get on to Bibi. It's a very tiny uh, kind of stopping a, a, a massive wound of large hotels and l accommodation being used across the country. It's welcome in the sense that, you know, it's obviously going to save the government probably around 40 million a year in, in respect of the numbers of people that are going on there, because that's what we're seeing at the moment. I mean, of course, it was closed down. Money put them there rather than out in hotels. But from when I was looking at the Home Office papers this morning that were released to us, that saving might not be there when I was trying to analyse the figures because they're giving Dorset Council £3,500 per bed. They're increasing the amounts of money going to the NHS and local doctors in the area to ostensibly prevent any overcrowding of doctors and, and the hospitals uh, and surgeries. So I'm not sure now when I've looked at those figures that the savings they initially said would be there are going to be there at all. I mean, it's, it's funny, isn't it? So 39 people were removed from the Bibby Stockholm. Those are the people originally on it when they found uh, legionnaires. And we know, don't we, as former MEPs, that you haven't had a shower system or hot water in the European Parliament for the best part of a decade because they had legionnaires in the European Parliament. I don't remember <laughs> just up or turning up there. Um, no. And they're there saying that, you know, that some, one of the protesters says, I think the barge is a horrible idea. It feels very oppressive. It feels like prison. Uh, does it feel like prison? I mean, this is got like a games room on board, cinema screens, no. a nurse, a doctor. This is where people who actually worked in oil rigs used to stay. I can't remember that being a humanitarian crisis when actual workers were living on here. What do they want these people to have? Like palm fronds and being fed grapes by hand? I think what they want is the accommodation and house that person who said it looked like a prison should be living in. And maybe what she should do is offer them her bedroom and her house and let them stay. And that would be a really equitable thing for her to do. It'd be honest, it'd be fair, and it wouldn't be costing the taxpayer lots of money. We've seen the images and pictures, haven't we, Alex, of what's actually going on inside of Bibi. It is not an unpleasant place to stay for anybody who is saying that they are fleeing torture and persecution and can't live in the tents in Calais. So I think really people have to get into perspective about it. The UN allows people to live in tents in different countries. It doesn't designate that you've got to have a four or five or three star hotel. It doesn't say that you've got to have a housing accommodation set up by the council. We could build a whole load of tents in this country and put asylum applicants in there and we wouldn't fall foul of either the ECHO or the UN Refugee Convention. The only reason that we go to it is because we're afraid of people like Just Stop Oil. Well, you're right. I mean, they've got a TV room. They've got a range of meals in the uh, canteen, 24-7 security, purpose-built safe accommodation, healthcare on board. They don't. They get free transport, don't they, and pocket money. If they don't have to stay on the barge, it's not a prison. They can go out and do what they want and then come back at the end of the day. But what we've since found out, of course, that some of these people who are due to be housed on the barge after, you know, how many months have not been on the barge have suddenly made best mates and they want to go live with their friends instead. I mean, what on earth is going on? Should we be able to say to migrants, I'm sorry, you came into this country legally, you can't go stay with Jake up the road because you met him in the pub one night. That's just not particularly secure. You might have come from a sort of you know, world of conflict, but we don't know if you're a good one or a bad one. Well, we don't know if you're a good one or a bad one. We just saw what happened in Belgium where somebody who was making an asylum application and had been rejected, actually shot two people from uh, Sweden in front of a football match before he himself was shot. We've se seen similar instances across Europe. It doesn't mean that, uh, and by a long shot, not all of those people who are claiming asylum 
are, are anywhere near that type of individual. There really is the security about the odd one or two that is actually doing that. The question that really should be is whether a government has the choice to select where the individuals go and when they make such an application. And I think it's pretty fair that any government should be able to select where they want those applicants to go whilst they're making an asylum claim, not just because they met, as you say, someone in the pub. Yeah, I mean, you made a very important point earlier about in many other countries. You look at Greece, you look at Italy. They, of course, two nations on the front line when it comes to the migrant crisis, scores of people crossing the Mediterranean, landing on their shores, and they have to really struggle to find accommodation. Um, and a lot of people in, in, in those particular countries are put in extremely temporary accommodation. You look at some of the other refugee sites, UN-backed around the world, and they are very makeshift. We're talking about encampments and tents and we're giving 500 people um you know, pretty decent accommodation if you're fleeing from conflict are you going to mind if you have to share a bedroom with one other person uh, as long as you've got hot food you've got uh, safety you've got uh, medicine i mean people in the uk can't even get a gp's appointment they've got a doctor on site uh, it seems to me like we're going above and beyond the call of duty here well, we, the United Kingdom does go above and beyond all the aspects of the UN Refugee Convention, the ECHR, in, even beyond that when they're making the decisions on asylum. After all, I've, I've said this many, many times, the vast majority of people who are given grants of protection, that's what people understand to be asylum in this country, is actually a discretionary decision made by Home Office officials under Home Office rules created in this process. It's not because they've re re been regarded as a genuine refugee under the UN Convention all fall within the ECHR. It's because we think it's okay for them to stay because it's not a great uh, situation for them living in the place that they've come from. So we're incredibly generous, incredibly generous in the way that w where we house them, incredibly generous in what we give to people. And it is a little bit tiresome to hear people say that we're a nasty country full of racists who don't care about people coming or fleeing from war and torture. We do very, very well. 